Welcome to We Can Geek, your new comics preview for November 13th. I'm Mike Ortiz. And I'm Chris Brown. I thought you were Spider-Man. Well, you know, it's cold in here. I've got to call and get my furnace fixed. It's the first uh, cold day, really. Yeah. And I turned my heat on, and it doesn't work, so I cut the hat on. Nice. Uh, <laughs> had me fooled. I, you know, I get funny comments when I'm out in public, and people say things <laughs> to me. I'm like, what? I'm like, oh, hey, Pete. I'm like, no, I'm Chris Brown. Oh. <laughs> so... So, all right, I'm going to lead off here with, uh, this is all new X-Men number 18, Battle uh, Battle for the Atom is over. Yep. Uh, this thing's, uh, things are shaking up. You yeah. know, a lot of our... Big changes. Indeed, our, our original X-Men have decided to go with Scott. Yeah. They're like, you know what, maybe they're not the bad guys. And I think this is sort of an interesting turn here, mm. where in trying to do so much good, rather than so many times when we've seen these stories where Professor X is, oh, well, he was manipulating and he was, oh, God, I'm tired of that. Right. Well, maybe in trying to do the right thing, they're continuously doing the wrong thing. Yeah. So, kind of interesting. I'm curious to see where this is going to go now. Now, this is the other side. This is our original X-Men now with the mm-hmm. other group. And we had been with, you know, uh, Beast and all those characters right. uh, for the bulk of the story. And now we're going to flip and see how the other half lives. You know, I, I have to, to admit, this book has kind of surprised me at every turn i mean it keeps going in direction just when you think you kind of and a lot of people be like oh well it's just going to be this and it's just going to be that and really they've they've continued to keep me on my toes i was did not see any of this coming i agreed it's been a great book it's it's very much uh gone beyond what you thought it was capable of Mm -hmm. and been a lot better than that yeah then i'm going to come over here this is uh to, to image comics this is issue number two of three the title Three issue number two. Um, this is sort of a, a three hundred kind of thing, but mm-hmm. rather than you know the the three hundred Spartans that go out, there are three soldiers, and there's a lot of interesting things going on. It's you know kind of a seedy underbelly, and it's focusing in on some of the people that were involved on it in mm-hmm. it rather than just the here's three hundred soldiers that go out. And well, what about all the other people that were with those three hundred soldiers yeah. that stood side by side and shoulder to shoulder with them? And this is going to go into that a little bit. And I liked the first issue. I thought it was cool. I like that stuff. It seems like, while it is certainly a, a work of fiction, it's probably a whole lot less fictional than right. 100, which right. is totally ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, I think the um, Kieran Gillen, who wrote that, just kind of said that this was 300 is a big, bombastic, yes. legendary sort of, of tale, and he wanted to tell something that's a little bit more grounded and real in the same thing. Right. So kind of, I, I like but, that but idea. But fictional, but yeah, definitely right. more down to down to earth. Than... 300 is not about people. 300 no. is about telling the story of a big battle. Yes. And this is about the people who fought that battle. Yeah, cool book. Yeah. Uh, next I'm looking at, this is issue number one of Umbral. This is by Anthony Johnston and Christopher Mitten. Uh, this is, it's, it says on the top here, a new dark fantasy from the creators of Wasteland. Wasteland was the title all over to Oni. Mm-hmm. It always looked interesting, but I never really jumped on it. The artwork here looks incredible. I don't really know what it's about, but it looks like, you know, okay, there's maps. I'm always a sucker for when you throw maps <laughs> in, like, hey, we've really thought about this universe. Here's a map. Mm-hmm. All right, that's cool. Um, the art, to me, looks incredible. Very nice. I, I'm really impressed with, with what they, they've got going here. Don't know anything about the story, but it's some kind of fantasy. It looks like maybe some magic and some weirdness and some creatures. Hmm. Eh, I'm in. I, you know, I like uh, it, image. Really lets its creators kind of do its thing, and you know, it's why there's so much variety over there. And yeah, I'm, I'm curious about that one. Next up, I've got issue number three of Sons of Anarchy. I'm actually enjoying this. I don't really uh, get into the whole you know adaptation thing right. very often. You know, oftentimes I'm like, eh. But to me, the reason I'm even still watching the show is because I like the the characters. I think mm-hmm. they're well developed characters, and they're kind of doing that kind of thing uh, here. They're they're really working the characters. Uh, Kozik's daughter comes back to find Tig. She says, "My dad said I could always trust you, even though in the story those two, you know, kind of had a falling out over a over a girl. She later find out is a girl dog, but uh, and, and they didn't like each other very well, but." Uh, she comes looking for Tig, and basically she's running from a, a group of mobsters because she saved some children from child pornography. And while, you know, the sons are in the adult film business, kids is not okay. So they're they're clearly going to stand behind this, and, you know, there's something, something's brewing, and I'm sure a bunch of people are going to get shot up, and bad stuff's going to happen. That's what generally happens in, in the television show. 
Then I've got Archer and Armstrong. This is issue number 15. This is the Sect Civil War Part 2. So things are going on within, you know, there, there were all these various groups that were all kind of working towards put, piecing back together the machine that kind of create made them immortal in the first place. That is the brothers, Eternal Warrior, Time Walker, and, and Aram Armstrong. Um, so there, there's some infighting, it looks like, going on there. Uh, they've been building a cool story. They've introduced Eternal Warrior and, and the, the Geomancers and just some really, really neat stuff in this book. And it's been a fun buddy book. It's goofy, it's fun, it's building a bigger story, it's cool. Harbinger number 18. This looks like it's got the bleeding monk on there, bleeding into Pete's brain. Um, I'm a little bit behind on this book. I do need to get, get caught up, but I think it's been really, really well done. I, I like the way they've uh, sort of taken a new look at the characters. Uh, yeah, you got to have Pete fighting Harada, you got to have the Harbinger Foundation, you have to do all that. But they're also doing some new things, some interesting things, and also giving you all the beats that you want to see. And there's an elf girl with elf ears. What the hell is going on? I don't know. All right. I'm in. Whatever. <laughs> I, I really like that book. And it's all been building up to uh, for, for Valiant, and they've all been real excited. This is their first big mm -hmm. crossover, big, big deal. Well, I guess they had the Harbinger Wars, but it only went kind of within yeah. a few different books. This is Unity. This is written by Matt Kent. This is art by Doug Braithwaite. Uh, this is some, you know, this is going to basically be, I believe, uh, the story of Exo Manowar and kind of what's what he's doing. Like everyone's sort of trying to figure out what the hell he's doing because he brought back all the descendants of his people who'd been captured by the Vine, you know, and they'd been slaves, you know, just generations of slaves on this, you know, spider alien ship. And uh, he's managed to save them and, and now has them working with him. But you've got all these groups now, it looks that are going to try and take him out. Uh, it looks like Ninjax in there, you know, he and, and uh, Exo Man of War kind of formed a bond against uh, what the Vine was doing, and they had originally hired Ninjax in those early issues. I don't know, it looks cool. They're going to weave all the characters in and, and do some cool stuff here. Matt Kent's a great writer. Cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what he can do. Uh, well, I'm going to start off with the Manhattan Projects number 16. Now, uh, I'm behind on this. I have not, uh, I'm an issue... Maybe, yeah, it reads maybe better two. in chunks anyway. It does. It flows a lot better. Um, but again, this is the continuing story of the the truth behind the Manhattan Project, which was just a cover to hide all the really cool super science things. Um, we've got uh, Oppenheimer, who's crazy, with multiple personalities. We've got an, alter an evil alternate dimension Einstein. Uh, all kinds of just crazy stuff. We've, we've been singing this book's praises from the yes. beginning. Yes. Uh, it's it's still yeah, just as good great. as it ever was. Great color, really kind of strange cartoony artwork. Uh, I'm not exactly sure where what's going on right now. Like I said, I'm a little bit behind. Uh, get used to hearing that because I'm going to be saying that a lot today. Uh, I have been slacking. Uh, next up, Triple Helix, uh, number two. This is uh, John Byrne's new superhero book. I think it's kind of interesting that he's uh, he's been doing uh, his own superhero stuff. Yeah. Uh, he did Trio which uh, very much was kind of like his homage to the Fantastic Four. Uh, Triple Helix ends with a big X. Uh, in many ways, uh, oh, these guys right. are similar to the original X-Men. Even the costume design seems yeah, the guy similar. looks like the Beast. You got a guy that looks like the Beast. You got a guy that's kind of like Colossus-ish. So yeah, this is John Byrne. Basically, he can't play with Marvel's X-Men, so he'll play with his own X-Men. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's, it's fun stuff. Uh, this is, uh, looks like it actually ties into Trio, I read somewhere that uh, one of the characters actually goes back to Danger Unlimited. Okay. So uh, so really a lot of the stuff that he's done over the years, he's kind of like creating his own mini superhero universe. Awesome. Uh, just kind of very slowly and, and not deliberately, so in many ways like the original Marvel Universe unfolded. Uh, like I said, I'm a big fan of John Byrne. I have not read the first issue because I'm behind on just about everything, uh, including Superior Spider-Man. Uh, behind on this too. This is still Doc Ock, uh, Giuseppe Comincoli. Last I was paying, last I read uh, it was the Spider-Man 2099 arc. Uh, this okay. has moved on from that. Spider-Man's fighting a fairly buff woman. I have no idea who she is. Almost looks like Captain Marvel's costume, but it, it does. It almost looks like a weird cross between her Ms. Marvel costume. Yeah, and, you know, with the high thigh boots and stuff. So yeah, I don't know who this yeah. is, uh, but it's uh, it's. You know, continuing the adventures of Otto Octavius and Peter's body. And there's, looks like someone in 
Doc Ock's body. That's odd. Is this you know, a flashback? Doc Ock was supposed to have died. The flashback? A oh, holographic interface. Thing. So now Doc Ock is in Peter's body wearing a hologram pretending to be Doc Ock. I don't know, but uh, oh, looks like uh, we've got some some goblin coming up. Uh, but yeah, I'm a couple issues behind, but it's still it's still Doc Ock. Uh, also behind, I've not caught up on Cataclysm. Last first, the first issue of Cataclysm came out last week. That was uh, Bendis and Bagley doing kind of the big picture. Uh, but this is the ultimate uh, Spider-Man version, the Miles Morales. This is his tie-in to the okay. big storyline. Uh, and this is by the regular creative team of Bendis and uh, David Marquez, who've been doing uh, stuff on Ultimate Spider-Man. I believe this is actually taking the place of Ultimate Spider-Man this month. Oh, is I it? Believe, okay. Uh, I believe all of these are kind of taking the place of, of the regular books. So, yeah, this is the Ultimate Spider-Man, and it, it actually looks like it's picking up from the regular Ultimate Spider-Man because we've got Cloak and Dagger in there. And uh, and then, yeah, Galactus. And Galactus is coming. Galactus at the end. So, yeah, we're... Uh, Probably witnessing the demise of the Ultimate Universe, but maybe not. But maybe not. Know. I don't know. That seems to be the speculation. Yeah, but. and it, Marvel seems to have been enjoying kind of like doing things uh, different than people are expecting lately. Now, we finally get to some books that I'm caught up on. Uh, we got Batman number 25 with a really sharp, all black, or black and dark gray embossed. Looks gloss really cool. Cover. It's the exact same cover for 24, except with different colors. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, cool really, stuff. DC? Are you phoning it in at this point? Not even giving us <laughs> What's covers. That pretty, pretty printing. Yeah, it's cool, but it looks <laughs> great if it wasn't the exact same cover from the, the image is exactly the same. Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, maybe, maybe they 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 lost the email with the real cover at the last minute. Uh, but in any event, uh, so we we had the wrap up to the Red Hood stuff in yep. uh, the last issue, and you know, basically seeing what may or may not be the origin of Joker. Uh, now it's moving into the Riddler, and uh, the Riddler is basically uh, going to be holding Gotham hostage. We got uh, a cool uh, new costume in the last issue, I believe. Is this the issue where they show the new, the new old Batmobile? Because obviously uh-huh. this is taking place uh, back during his first year. Yeah, the new old Batmobile, which actually does not look very cool. <laughs> Looks like no, it doesn't at all. But it doesn't uh, even look as cool as the ZZ Top car. I can I can see why the Batman didn't keep this Batmobile. But uh, yeah, Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo basically giving their take on the first year of Batman. Uh, you know, like I said, we got the Joker stuff before. Now he's uh, squaring off against the Riddler for the first time. We've got all the usual suspects. We've got Gordon. We've got Alfred, uh, and we've got the young Bruce Wayne still learning his ropes as the Batman. This has been been pretty solid stuff, and I, I, love I like it. Greg Capullo's artwork a lot. Uh, a lot of books have been tying into Zero Year, jumping back in time. Action Comics did it last week. And now we've got uh, Green Lantern Corps, oddly tying okay. into Zero Year. But it's basically uh, John Stewart back when he was a Marine, uh, before he was a Green Lantern, and uh, giving a little bit more of his backstory. How cool. Uh, so that's kind of interesting. It looks like, I think there's some sort of uh, a hurricane is heading for Gotham. And uh, it's ca- Joker's causing a big blackout or something. And so I think he's part of the military response to the hurricane. How this ties in with Batman, who knows? I think a lot of it is, uh, it's zero years kind of given people a chance to tell stories set in the past of the, the DC yes. universe uh, and also kind of capitalize on what's DC's best-selling book. So, uh, But yeah, this is this is some interesting stuff. I mean, we've got a Green Lantern book that doesn't have a Green Lantern in it. But it's got John Stewart. It's got John Stewart as a Marine. I saw Batman in there. And it did have Batman, but I guess we're going to get to see John Stewart as a hero without the ring. So uh, that's always cool stuff. I mean, that's one, one of the things is, I like about... this is before The Daily Show. This is before The Daily Show. This is... Uh, he gets that gig later. And uh, so, yeah, that's, that's kind of kind of interesting that this thing that started off as just a storyline in Batman has now become a way for other writers to tell stories yeah. of the past, which a lot of us have been wondering. I remember ever since the New yes. 52 started, people were like, well, what happened in all that time period? And it's like, just wait. Right. They will get to it. They don't have to tell, tell you something you now. Every, you're going to get a little bit over the next couple of years. Next up, we got Justice League of America, number nine. This is tying into the Forever Evil. Uh, Matt Kent again. He's everywhere these days. Uh, Tom Derenick, uh doing a nice fill-in job. Uh, I think I, I'm a little behind on some of the Forever Evil stuff. The last I, I left off, uh, I think they uh, they had revealed that the Justice League were absorbed into the Firestorm Matrix. Okay. And uh, that's what happened to them. 
Uh, but yeah, I'm not exactly uh, sure what, what happened uh, in, in this book. Uh, the last time I think we just found out that they, the Justice League characters were all uh, having these sort of hallucinations or something, and they're all they're all trapped somewhere. And it turns out it's the Firestorm Matrix. I didn't read the last issue of Forever Evil right. yet, so I don't know what's going on there. But it looks like we've got Martian Manhunter. We've got uh, him battling himself in his mind. We've got Star Girl in here. Uh, but yeah, this is all just sort of fleshing out the Forever Evil storyline. Uh, all these Justice League books have been tying into Forever Evil pretty well, and uh, so far they've been pretty good. So that's my stack. Well, that brings me to the, the top of my stack here, which is uh, we finally, a month after part one came out, we got the second part of the bi-weekly series, <laughs> uh, All Out War for Walking Dead. They they put the first issue out, then they said, well, they're not all going to be bi-weekly. Well, you said they were, and then so I don't know how the schedule is going to be exactly, mm -hmm. but you know this is going to be a big 12-parter. This was a great issue. Uh, the the first issue was you know a lot of a lot of setup. You know basically uh, our our survivors and people from the kingdom and the people from the hilltop all go to to Negan's camp and say, "This is it. Give yourself up, or we're uh, we're coming in." And Negan's like, "Wow, you know you guys got some some balls on you, but uh, yeah, here I got this guy. So he's got the the, the guy from uh, the the hilltop, and he says, "Hey." You guys fight this. You're not allowed in the hilltop. Like everyone, you know that that's uh, that that's it. So you think they're going to divide the camp, and then you find out what happens. And it's kind of nice in the first couple of pages. You know, like eight people walk away, and Negan says, "I'm counting eight guys. Really, eight guys? Really? <laughs> Told me it was half their army. Uh, I thought it was." So then you get to kind of see Rick and Jesus enacting their plan, and what it's something you certainly didn't expect. It's uh, it, it's pretty cool. Um, uh, Negan's got some some great lines, uh, which include "I hope you have your shitting pants on." Um, uh, the, it really just a good issue. It, it's pretty intense, and uh, you know, Rick kind of declares, "I told you, the person who's going to win this thing is the, per the group that attacks first. So yeah, but there's still ten more to go. So there's still a long way to go. Even though I think Rick and his crew put in a really nice dent." At least, uh, you know, they fired that first shot, and it was a really good one. So, uh, yeah, it's been good stuff. It's getting interesting and fun again. Walking Dead had been a little slow there for a while, even though Negan had been a great antagonist. But they were slowly building and slowly building, and here we are. Cool. Uh, well, my top pick is uh, X-Men Gold. Uh, this is celebrating uh, the X-Men's 50th anniversary. And the reason that, uh, that I'm picking this up now I do I do have one gripe right off the bat. This has got a lot of different creators on here. Okay. And uh, when they do that, I really wish they would have like the page that lists all of the creators, not just like at the beginning of each story. But uh, you know we've got here Chris Claremont and Bob McCloud, uh, who, who brought us. I mean Chris Claremont obviously right. probably the single biggest gun in X Men history. Bob McCloud, who along with Claremont launched the New Mutants, uh, longtime Marvel artist. Uh, we've got Louise and Walter Simonson. Uh, as well as Stan Lee doing oh. scripting on a story. We've got Len Wein, who created the X-Men with uh, Jorge Molina. Looks like we've got... Who did this one? That's what I was saying. That because you have to look at the beginning of each story, uh, Roy Thomas. All right. Uh, this is like a, a who's who of, of, of big X-Men guys. We don't have John Byrne, unfortunately. He still hates Marvel. Right. But we got Fabian Nicieza and Salvador La Roca, who had a nice run in the 90s. Uh, looks like we've got... Like some little, some uh, Eddie, new X Men, some Eddie McGinnis art. Oh no, these are just. Uh, oh, that's just a preview to amazing samples of Jason Aaron. Oh, so half this book is previews. Well, that kind of sucks. But anyway, yeah, it looks like pages from. Yeah, I was like, wow, we we get more Bendis and Stuart Inman, but no, these are actually just previews of of Amazing X Men and all new X Men. Those chintzy punks. But you still get a good chunk of original material. How much did you get you for that though? Uh, that's six bucks. Really? Yeah, five ninety nine. Wow, Marvel. Yeah, that's that's a little steep. I mean, if I if I had known that those last pages were uh, were being printed elsewhere, I might not have made this my my top pick. But this is my top pick anyway, uh, mostly just because we get to see these cool people working on this stuff. Um, Walt Simonson, uh, Louise Simonson, Bob McCloud, all these kind of classic X Men guys. And and uh, if you're feeling nostalgic for X Men comics of old, give this a shot. I, th I thought Neil Adams had done something. Maybe he did a variant cover. Okay, maybe. Neil Adams seems to do nothing but variant covers. These days, crazy yeah. Crazy Batman stories. But, uh, yeah, just kind of nice to see these uh, these old guys 
uh, coming back to the characters that uh, that they worked on from years past. It looks like the the all new X Men are basically are being done by Louise Simonson and Walter Simonson, who did those characters on X Factor. Yes. So uh, some really nice pairings, some really great uh, great creators from the past. It's good to see them back getting some work. I know a lot of those guys don't get a lot of work these days. It's true, and uh, and that's unfortunate. But uh, I mean, I wish I wish some of them got more than just a little give me one shot here or there. But I'll take it. Yeah, take what you can get. Yep. But uh, that is uh, your power packed week in geek. <laughs>